Ladies and gentlemen, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce to you Tom Gerstmar. Tim. He is an outstanding naturopathic practitioner. He specializes in the treatment of intestinal disorders and really, really hard to treat autoimmune diseases. Please welcome Tim Gerstmar. Thank you. All right, everyone hear me okay? Great. Welcome, I'm really glad I could take the opportunity to be with you here today. We have 20 minutes. I was really hoping for 40, and I offered to arm wrestle Keith Norris for a 40-minute uh, slot, but as you can guess, that didn't work out very well for me. So we've got 20 minutes to cover what I feel is possibly the most important aspect of the whole paleo movement or any movement, diet, exercise philosophy for long-term success. So as she said, my name is Dr. Tim Gersmar. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I have a practice in Redmond, Washington, which is near Microsoft, where I work with people locally, nationally throughout the nation, and internationally as well. I've spoken at AHS a number of times, but this is my first time here at Paleo FX, and I'm happy I could be here with you. Usually I talk about very advanced topics, gut health and the microbiome, methylation, but like I said, I want to cover something more important today, and that's really mindset. So with that in mind, let's get going. This is my co-presenter. He's been dead about 100 years now. His name is Vilfredo Pareto. He was an Italian economist, and he's most famous for discovering something we know now as the 80-20 rule. So he found, in studying economics, that 80% of the wealth of all of the places that he studied was held by 20% of the population, while the other 80% of the population held just 20% of the wealth. We're gonna take that principle that he discovered and apply it to the paleo movement. So what's the problem that most of us face nowadays? It's that we're confused, overwhelmed, and ultimately paralyzed. And the question is, why? Now, who here has Googled something about paleo? Right, was that a good experience in general for you? Most people I run into find that it causes confusion, overwhelm, and paralysis. And these are just a few of the things that people run into when they start to look into paleo and figure out, what the hell am I supposed to do with this, right? Should you be high carb, low carb, or ketogenic? Should you be carnivorous or plant paleo, or a new term now, pegan or paleo-vegan or pescatarian paleo-vegan? When should you eat your carbs, breakfast or dinner or never or somewhere in between, and will you explode if you don't? You know, should you intermittent fast and for how long and how much? Should you eat resistant starch because it will save your gut microbiome or maybe it will actually make it worse? I don't know what to do, right? And can I no longer eat chicken or pork because it has omega-6 fatty acids in it? And should I do aerobic exercise or not? Or is CrossFit mandatory to get my paleo card, right? So most people, when faced with this onslaught of information, end up doing exactly nothing and just keep going the way they have been. I view part of the problem as what I call the shiny, sexy effect. Now, we're hardwired by evolution to seek out novel, interesting, and different things. That was a good thing when you were looking around trying to find something to eat, a good place to live, uh, and what was over the next mountain. But we're faced with a tsunami of information nowadays. I love the internet as much as anybody, but it actually gives us too much information, and we respond by doing nothing. I like biohacking, and I've done quite a bit of it, but I've ultimately found that the problem can be that we spend so much time trying to get better that we don't have any time to actually use that better to do anything. So I've gone through phases, you can ask my wife, where I was tracking and fiddling around with so much stuff that it took me over two hours from the time that I got up in the morning to the time when I could actually go out and do anything, which in the end kind of sucked, right? So I will share with you a metric and an algorithm that I now use that's a lot simpler and I feel gets us most of the way there without all the complicated gadgets and other high-tech gizmos. Now, 
Since they're not here, I'm going to say that Mark Sisson and others stole from me the idea of good over perfect and liked my presentation so much that they made a panel on it later today. And no one can disagree with me because they're not here right now. So who here thinks perfect is definitely better than good? Right. The rest of you are probably lying or afraid to raise your hands, right? Perfect is definitely better than good, except it's not, right? Perfect leads us into 100 zero thinking. Either I'm eating free range kale or I'm eating CAFO donuts and there's nothing in between. Either I'm doing it perfectly and Mark Sisson and the paleo gods are looking down and smiling at me or I'm doing nothing and I've buried myself in a pile of Twinkies, right? Perfect thinking is not sustainable and not useful, though we all want to do it. Good enough is not as sexy or interesting, but it gets done. Because is there anyone here who would really like great success for a year, they lose weight, they feel better, rainbows come out, but then a year later, they're back exactly where they were before. That's what most of us do. We lose the same 10 pounds over again. We retread the same path over and over again. We're perfect for a little while, and then we give up. What I'm arguing here is that we give up trying to be A plus students, and we settle for the B minus or the C because that lets us graduate. The governing principles that I think we should use are to emphasize the good over the perfect, to use the 80-20 rule, and to keep things simple. Because if we do these three things, we can have long-term success that far outweighs having six-pack abs, but means the next 10, 20, 30 years of our lives, we can live in good health. The 80-20 rule, for those of you who don't know, says that in any activity, whether it's a business, whether it's your personal life, that 20% of the things that you do give you 80% of the results that you receive, while 80% of the things that you do give you 20% of the results that you get. So a small number of things give you most of the benefit of anything that you do, while a large number of things give you a small amount of benefit. Most of us spend way too much time on the 80%. We invest a lot of our time, our energy, and our money for relatively small gain when instead my argument is that we should focus on the 20% that gives us the majority of the benefit. If we overcomplicate things, it becomes unsustainable. Most of us like complex things because they are interesting, new, and different, but they are unsustainable. So again, if you want to do something perfectly for a short period of time, get the benefit, and then end up back where you are now, or worse, then adopt something complicated because you will not be able to sustain it in the long term. Or if you can, you are a better person than I am. If we keep things simple, that makes them doable. Now, a keystone is the stone, as you see, at the top of an arch. It is the single most important stone in that arch because if you take it out, the entire thing will fall down. If you pull one of the other stones away, the arch can still stand, but without the keystone, it will fall. I believe there are four keystone habits that we can undertake that will get us 80% of the way to our health goals. The first is nutrition. Now, nothing causes more overwhelm, confusion, frustration, and ultimately paralysis than nutrition or what we should eat. The issue here is that context matters. There is no one single perfect diet for everyone in every circumstance. If we could all embrace this, the dietary dogma and the, uh, the dietary theology would disappear. But unfortunately for humans, this is a hard thing to accept. What are your goals for your nutrition? Are you trying to be healthy? Or are you training for the Olympics? We can all agree that the dietary needs of an Olympic athlete are going to be different 
from someone whose primary goal is health. Or if you're training for a bodybuilding competition and trying to get 4% body fat, your dietary needs would be different from someone who is eating for their health. Yet, we look at someone on the internet and we copy their diet and the thing that worked for them, and then we're frustrated when it doesn't work for us, when we don't recognize or consciously take into the fact that their context is very different from what ours is. Also, we have to ask, men, are you a man or are you a woman? Their needs are different. Are you young or old? Their needs are different. Are you healthy or do you have pre-existing health problems? Changes what you need to eat and special circumstances like being pregnant or breastfeeding. So there is no one perfect diet, and even for an individual, there still is no one perfect diet because what worked for you when you were 18 and athletic may not work for you when you're 70 and more sedentary. We could spend literally years talking about all of the differences in the different diets, even among the paleo community. Well, what's different between the perfect health diet and Mark's primal diet and on and on and on, but I feel it's more productive to talk about what these diets have in common. And I believe that boils down to a very short list. And those are, they emphasize simple whole foods with minimal processing. Now, we can engage in a lot of mental masturbation about what whole foods mean or real foods mean, but seriously, give me a break, right? It's kind of like pornography, you know it when you see it, and not a lot of explanation is required. They're mostly foods that are nutrient dense and calorie poor, or if we like math, we can say nutrient, nu nutrient density over caloric density, and we're gonna favor foods that are very nutritious. Omnivorous, that gets a star because of course, uh, the vegan community is gonna disagree on this, but they'll agree on every other point. Generally high in fiber, yes, if you have SIBO or other digestive problems, again, context matters. And rich foods or treats are reserved for special occasions, not every day. We can take those things and create the keep it simple plate. There are many prescriptions for what you should put on your plate, good foods and bad foods and amounts of foods but I think we can make it simpler and still get the 80% that most of us are looking for. I believe when we look at a plate, we can ask several questions. Do you have protein on your plate? Whether that's meat of any kind, dairy if you tolerate it, legumes, eggs, any other kind of proteinaceous foods, is it on your plate? If no, then start over again. Do you have vegetables on your plates? We can argue about types and amounts and kinds and different families of vegetables, but the bottom line is, do you actually have any on your plate? Copious amounts are helpful. Ketchup and french fries are not vegetables, despite what the USDA tells us. You need some fat. So, as a community, we have gone to the I love fat, but we know now, I do from working with loads of people, that some people do extremely well on high fat diets and others do very poorly. So, context matters. If a high fat diet does not work for you, stop doing it. But we need some fat and that should be either as part of your protein source, part of your vegetable source, things like avocados and olives, or you need to add some to your plate. Then, the dreaded carbs. So, context matters. It, you may need a lot of carbs. Someone else may not. And again, we have to find out what works for us. But after you've put a pro some sort of protein on your plate and loads of vegetables on your plate, add the carbs that work for you. Then, anything else. So if you want a cookie, have your cookie after you've eaten your protein, your vegetables, and your carbs. That way you'll be mostly full and you'll eat less of it, all right? I believe if we asked ourselves these four, these four or five points when we constructed our meals, that that would get us 80% of the way to eating healthy. Sleeping, I wish this was a little bigger. Anybody with kids, um, this is a hysterical uh, little picture. Maybe you can look later. But let's keep it simple. 
Most people need more than seven hours of sleep per night, and many people need eight to nine hours of sleep per night. If you're getting in that range, that's a good starting place. You need a dark bedroom. We're not going to go into all the circadian pieces now, but in general, your bedroom should be dark. And the most important question that I'll ask you later is, do you wake up feeling rested? If you do, you're probably doing something right. If you don't, something is wrong. All of us are stressed. As Americans, we like that fact. We celebrate that fact that we're stressed, right? It means we're doing something and God is looking down on us and smiling because we are stressed. It's a problem. Stress hurts us. We need to be actively engaged in some sort of stress management technique to offset our ultra busy lives. Now this is very individual. So for some people, mindfulness, heart rate variability, journaling, getting time out in nature, spending time with friends, socializing, whatever works well for them. For other people, they need to find something else. This is perhaps the most individual piece of what I'm talking to you about to you today, and it can change. So you need to find what helps you to de-stress. And just going to bed at night is necessary, but not sufficient to help you handle your stress. Oops. So, movement. Outside of diet, this is probably the piece that garners the most, yeah, thank you, that garners the most confusion. Do I have to do eight, you know, high intensity training, low intensity training, kettlebells, snatches, whatever, right? Again, context matters. So, what are your goals? Are you training, exercising, or moving just to be healthy? Nothing wrong with that at all. Are you engaged in performance? And my caution is many people are training for performance and they never have a performance, right? Athlete, if you are an athlete, great. If you are not, my recommendation is don't train like an athlete because you have nowhere to go. Or are you training primarily for body composition? What you will need to do for each of these things are different. If you want all three of these, then you will be mediocre at all of them but that can work too. So many people have seen or at least have some understanding of this, the health fitness curve, which says, oh, there we go, can't see the laser pointer, that far down to the side, if you are bedridden, you have essentially zero fitness and your health will suffer tremendously for it. As you begin to become a little more fit, your health jumps up and you quickly become healthier. As you continue to get more fit, your health does not necessarily improve beyond that point, but your fitness does. And if you continue pushing your fitness, it will actually begin to degrade your health. Olympic athletes and NFL players live shorter lives for the most part than people who don't train like they do. There's a cost to training like that. So, the 80-20 rule says that somewhere right around there, give or take, we, be, we maximize the health benefits of exercise while keeping our time commitment very reasonable. For me, the keep it simple takeaway is if people will move for 30 minutes a day, they will get roughly the majority, the 80% of the benefits that they get from movement. I recommend that it should be fun because if it's not, you won't do it for a very long time. And ideally, I think you should do some strength training, and that doesn't mean you have to do barbells or anything like that, but you need to move some weight. What takeaway do we want from this? In summary, if you use the 80-20 rule and you keep things simple, you will avoid perfectionism. If you avoid perfectionism, it means you will actually be doing the behaviors that promote your health and will give yourself long-term success. This is not a sexy message. Uh, it's not something that makes most people jump up and down, but it's true. If you follow the four keystone habits of nutrition, sleep, stress, and movement, you will build a foundation of health. No one gets very excited about a foundation, but if we neglect the foundation, this is what happens.
an architect, spent a very long time designing the tower at Pisa. As you can maybe see, it's very fancy. There's lots of bling and swag, all those columns, all the fancy pieces. A lot of money was spent creating this thing, a lot of time and labor. But, whoops, they forgot to build a good foundation. And now they spend a tremendous amount of time, energy, and money to keep this thing from falling down. I see this happen all the time in people who come to see me who are focusing on the 80% of things that give small returns while neglecting the 20% of things that are foundational for their health. Again, this is not sexy, but it's important. Here's the new algorithm that I use instead of tracking and testing and futzing with everything. I simply, in my journal, ask myself five questions. Did I get at least seven hours of sleep last night? If I'm consistently answering no, then I'm falling down on that piece and need to make adjustments. Did I wake feeling rested? If I'm continuously not feeling rested, something is wrong and needs to be adjusted. Did I eat protein and vegetables with almost all of my meals, right? And now 80-20 gives us the freedom to not have to make sure that every single meal, every single day is exactly perfect. But if most of the time I'm at least getting protein and vegetables in with my meals, then I'm 80% of the way there. Did I move for 30 minutes today? And did I do something actively to help manage my stress load? I believe that if most of the time you can answer yes to this question, you will be 80% of the way there. And like Alan Watts said at the beginning, life is to be lived. If you spend all of your time focused on your health to the exclusion of doing something meaningful and valuable with your life, then you've tended your health, but you've wasted your life. I believe that if we focus on the 20% that gives us 80% of the benefits, we can use that other 80% of our time to go and do something awesome with our lives. If you would like an 80-20 cheat sheet that I've made, you can go to my website, which is listed here at 80-20 sheet. You can enter your name and email, and I would love to send it to you. I have a couple of minutes for questions. I thank you all for your attention. If there are any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hold on. OK, right here. Actually, it's for my sister. Oh, sorry. Oh. Well, I was just wondering, um, I don't sleep seven hours. Right. I sleep, I, I, no matter what, I go to bed at 10 or 11 or 12. It doesn't matter. And I wake up at 4. I just right. do. It's well, like my cycle, and I'm wake and I'm awake and ready to go for the day. Yeah. And well, I would ask, are you? Do you feel rested and energetic and well? Then, then that's working for you, right? So again, individuals. Most people fall within the need for seven or more hours of sleep a night. If you're one of those people who don't, and you wake feeling rested and things are going well, then that's where you are, and you should honor that, right? Very good. Any other questions? There's one right over here. Right here, yes. Um, my question is, does this, do you think this 80-20 rule applies even if you're dealing with a serious health issue? Like, right, right. Because it's like, do you, it, there's, a, there's certain pressure, I feel like, to be perfect if you're trying to recover from right. like a Well, look, I think regardless, perfection doesn't work. It just creates shame and guilt, and you beat yourself up for it. So. What I always tell people is that health is simple and disease is complicated. So if you're sick and you have underlying health conditions, do you have to do probably more than these few basic things? Yes. Do you have to be perfect? No, right? And you will set yourself up for more stress and more hardship by trying to be perfect. Do you have to work hard at the things that are appropriate for you? Sure. But we're human beings, right? We're not going to be perfect. More questions? Any more questions? Well, I have one, if sure. you don't mind. Sure. I'm wondering, when a client comes to you, right. what, could you walk us through what happens? Do they contact you online? And then what, do you give them an intake form? How does it work? Sure. 
Um, all right. Well, yeah. So, I mean, people seek me out in a variety of ways, some of them locally and some of them from wherever. And, you know, we usually have a little discussion beforehand to find out if we're a good fit for one another. Um, I recommend if your doctor won't talk to you before you come in to see them, you probably should find another doctor, right? And then, obviously, there's the paperwork to fill out, and then people come in for the visit, and we spend a long time. You know, my first visit's 90 minutes, which is a long time compared to a lot of doctors. But, again, context really matters, and you have to take time with someone to figure out what's going on for them. And again, if your doctor gives you eight minutes, or 10 minutes, or 15 minutes, like, that's great, but how are they really gonna get context on you and your situation and what's going on for you? So Thank is that you. Great. That's perfect. Thank Any you all. Any other questions? If not, great. thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks. it. Give it up for Tim. Thank you.